So what I think I'm expected to say or why I was asked to be here to represent the view that the founding represented a kind of political perfection or end state, but in a non-historicist understanding of politics. That is to say, contra Hegel and his heirs, in this, in this understanding that I'm supposed to represent, history does not have a direction or a culmination. The same basic passions or mixture of appetites, passions, and reason operate within human beings in all times and places. The interplay of these factors, above all which are ascendant in given souls at a given time, that interplay explains both politics and history, but history understood as outcomes or as an account of what actually happened, not as an inexorable, pro inexorable process. Um, the perfection that this view claims the founders achieved was made possible by the discovery of a new science of politics. That's not a direct quote, but it's a fairly accurate paraphrase of Hamilton in Federalist 9. Right? We can solve problems that mankind has not solved before because of advances in the science of politics. Um, and this science in this account was like electricity before Franklin. Part of the nature of things and permanent but unknown and waiting to be discovered and harnessed. Now the obvious objection seems, would seem to be that if this new science is as good as it purports to be, then it should first of all settle political co questions, at least the biggest ones for all time. Now that may sound kind of historicist, but again, in this understanding there is no capital H history and thus no end state. There is only a rational state that was in principle knowable at any time, but in actuality discovered at a specific time. Uh, but once it has been discovered, the new science implemented, that should be it, right? Problem solved. So how did we end up where we are? Um, now, my, my school or my sect or my subsect answers that with a corruption narrative, right? Bad ideas corrupted it. In particular, bad ideas imported from Germany corrupted it. Um, and this, uh, I'll skip that. We gotta... Now, I don't think there's any question that that happened. Capital P progressivism, which many of my colleagues have been focusing on for decades, which is a German import, did change America. It changed our educational system, for instance. It, 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 there really wasn't much of a concept of the research university in America before the second half, really the third quarter of the 19th century. Um, it changed our government, ruled by experts, or in w Woodrow Wilson, uh, one of the leading progressive scholars and politicians, called it the, the men of the schools. Uh, and it created a fourth branch, of, or it led to the creation of a fourth branch of government within the second, right? The so-called uh, administrative state, or in uh, a term much in use lately, the deep state. But those are two different things, although I'm not gonna go into that now because it's kind of a side point. Um, and in a way, it changed our understanding of reality itself. I think prior to this understanding coming, you know, crossing the Atlantic and becoming first embedded among the intellectuals and then widely accepted, Americans were basically not historicist. But they have become so, or history has become a core part of American intellectual self-understanding. Um, for instance, the former president, Barack Obama, liked to say and said often, he would term something he didn't like as being on the wrong side of history, and things that he did like were on the right side of history. Um, uh, unlike the found, this is different from the founder's conception, the American founders, of a discovered political science that simply captures the essence of man and, pol and of politics. But, you know, like that old saw, I, I worked in the politics a couple times and I've read a lot of these memoirs and, you know, there's a famous one, uh, anecdote, it actually pops up here and there. The one that I've heard the, uh, the most and I think is true is that Jim Baker, former Secretary of State, and George H.W. Bush are arguing about some point in the Oval Office and I can't remember what it was. And finally Bush gets uh, testy and decides to cut off the argument by saying, if you're so smart, why aren't you president? Um, if the founding was so perfect, if the founders' new science was correct, how did, how did this happen? How did we get here? How did a correct understanding of nature and a true account of politics, how could it be so badly and, and even easily corrupted? Okay, so this brings me to the contrary view that I mentioned earlier, which seems to be, if not exactly, Professor Deneen's argument, it, it, it's at least close or similar. Um, this view posits a fundamental change in thought, but places that change well before the 19th century. According to this account, the change goes back at least to the 16th century, to Machiavelli in some of the most famous tellings. Indeed, I note that um, Professor Deneen himself points to the Florentine as a prime mover in the story. Those of you who have the book, pages 24, 25, 167. Uh, 
The change was a, a reorientation of political thought away from looking up toward the virtue or completion or perfection of man's nature and downward toward the fulfillment of mankind's actual needs and wants in the here and now. The change in thought thus precedes and paves the way toward, and I think crucially is intended to pave the way toward, a change in political practice. So it's not a change in theory simply for theory's sake or for achieving a more correct understanding. It's trying to do something in the real, in the real world. In this understanding, these changes did not corrupt the United States and the founders' vision. Rather, not just the country's political principles, but the country itself are products of that change. Hence, despite America's immense and evident success in this understanding, it was doomed from the beginning, as are all liberal or modern societies. Liberal understood quite broadly in that sense. Um, so what we're seeing now is not simply the sad but inevitable or no, sorry, not, no, are simply the sad and inevitable workings out of the core principles of a bad design. Now, Professor Deneen says at more than one point in his book, correctly in my view, that the classical and biblical traditions define liberty as self-rule of human appetites and passions, to forestall tyranny, and to allow and enable human flourishing at its peak. To reiterate, I think that's right. He contrasts that with a modern view of liberty in essence to do whatever we want, complete freedom, to fulfill whatever uh, high, high uh, ambition or base passion, and, and a kind of ultimately an inability even to tell the difference between the two or to sustain the notion that there is a difference. Okay? He, um, and he, does, he, he, that is Professor Deneed, can and does marshal much evidence in support of this view. But most of it, I think, is from philosophers and writers not, and less from the founders themselves who absolutely did believe in the classical biblical view. That is, the purpose of freedom is for uh, human, human flourishing and practice of the virtues. And it's not that difficult to prove that, I, I think, by quoting the founders themselves, you know, famously uh, Washington from his first inaugural. I'll just give two examples. Probably you've all heard them before, but you know, that there is an indissoluble union between virtue and happiness. He says that no truth is more established in the economy of nature that there is an indissoluble union between virtue and happiness. He goes on. Um, uh, or the famous quote, even more famous, quoted everywhere from Madison, that the Constitution is suited only to a moral and religious and people, and it can't, it will not succeed in governing any other type. You know, you can, you can rack these quotes up. There's page after pages of them. Um, and you can even point to similar type quotes in the philosophic texts under consideration. For instance, Lo I mean, Locke um, actually says he has no problem uh, censoring atheists or even really any view that he says is contract, uh, contra contrary to public morals. Um, the great founder of modern economic liberalism, Adam Smith, has a whole second book, well, I guess there's more than one, but this is the other major one called A Theory of Moral Sentiments, whose great theme is none of the stuff I describe in the free market will really work uh, or be sustainable without a moral foundation in human society, right? So it's not, it's not this kind of wide open liberalism. Um, yeah, I'm gonna skip that. Uh, even then, we still face the even you know. Then we still face the problem that even if there is a some kind of intended secret radicalism to these thinkers, um, or if it's simply uh, a mistake on their part, they didn't realize the um, implications of the radicalism of their thought. We have to grasp the fact that it was these American founders actually acting in specific circumstance, and not Locke or any other writer or philosopher who founded the country. And while they did so partly on Lockean grounds. They were founding a country, not writing a book. Um, and it's, it's, it's not very difficult, just as it isn't difficult, I think, to marshal quotes in support of an earlier understanding of virtue from these thinkers, uh, nor is it difficult to point to actual actions and laws that they passed that, that support this view. Think about I mean, it's another example, uh, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 that governs uh, all the territory acquired in the Thirty Years' War. Sorry. I have that on the brain from another seminar I did. The Seven Years' War, I li that's a great trick question for students, by the way. You ask them, how long did the Thirty Years' War last? How long did the Seven Years' War? How long did the Hundred Years' War ask? You, you, you'd be surprised at what you get from them. Um, uh, all this territory that, had not been, that was not part of the original 13 and not yet organized into states. They write a law before the passage of the Constitution, and that law is really specific about the moral character necess necessary for free government and all these institutions that are going to need to sustain it. Okay. Um, and, it, and, and, and of course, many quotes and actions that are 
not merely compatible with the founders believing that religion is an indispensable foundation for society, but you know, for instance, they had no problem with an established church at the state level and did not outlaw it. They outlawed it only at the federal level and tolerated and even encouraged all kinds of public support for religion throughout the states. 